Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Today we have reached part nine of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, the penultimate episode. Last time, Dorian plumbed further depths of cruelty and depravity. He murdered Basil Hallward in cold blood after showing him his picture, the true face of Dorian Gray. But is that his conscience troubling him? It's time to pull up a chair, relax and enjoy the penultimate episode of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Chapter 15 that evening, at 8.30, exquisitely dressed and wearing a large buttonhole of Parma violets, Dorian Gray was ushered into Lady Narborough's drawing-room by bowing servants. His forehead was throbbing with maddened nerves, and he felt wildly excited, but his manner as he bent over his hostess's hand was as easy and graceful as ever. Perhaps one never seems so much at one's ease as when one has to play a part. Certainly no one looking at Dorian Gray that night could have believed that he had passed through a tragedy as horrible as any tragedy of our age. Those finely shaped fingers could never have clutched a knife for sin, nor those smiling eyes have cried out on God and goodness. He himself could not help wondering at the calm of his demeanour, and for a moment felt keenly the terrible pleasure of a double life. It was a small party— got up rather in a hurry by Lady Narborough, who was a very clever woman with what Lord Henry used to describe as the remains of a really remarkable ugliness. She had proved an excellent wife to one of our most tedious ambassadors, and having buried her husband properly in a marble mausoleum, which she had herself designed, and married off her daughters to some rich, rather elderly men, she devoted herself now to the pleasures of French fiction, French cookery, and French esprit when she could get it. Dorian was one of her especial favourites, and she always told him that she was extremely glad she had not met him in early life. "'I know, my dear, I should have fallen madly in love with you,' she used to say, "'and thrown my bonnet right over the mills for your sake. It is most fortunate that you were not thought of at the time. As it was, our bonnets were so unbecoming, and the mills were so occupied in trying to raise the wind, that I never had even a flirtation with anybody. However, that was all Narborough's fault. He was dreadfully short-sighted, and there is no pleasure in taking a husband who never sees anything. Her guests this evening were rather tedious. The fact was, as she explained to Dorian behind a very shabby fan, one of her married daughters had come up quite suddenly to stay with her, and to make matters worse, had actually brought her husband with her. "'I think it is most unkind of her, my dear,' she whispered. "'Of course, I go and stay with them every summer after I come from Homburg, but then an old woman like me must have fresh air sometimes, and besides, I really wake them up. You don't know what an existence they lead down there. It is pure, unadulterated country life.' They get up early, because they have so much to do, and go to bed early, because they have so little to think about. There has not been a scandal in the neighbourhood since the time of Queen Elizabeth, and consequently they all fall asleep after dinner. You shan't sit next to either of them. You shall sit by me and amuse me. Dorian murmured a graceful compliment and looked round the room. Yes, it was certainly a rather tedious party. Two of the people he had never seen before, and the others consisted of Ernest Harrowden, one of those middle-aged mediocrities so common in London clubs who have no enemies but are thoroughly disliked by their friends, Lady Ruxton, an overdressed woman of 47, with a hooked nose, who was always trying to get herself compromised, but was so peculiarly plain that to her great disappointment no one would ever believe anything against her. Mrs. Erlin, a pushing nobody, with a delightful lisp and Venetian red hair, Lady Alice Chapman, his hostess's daughter, a dowdy, dull girl, but with one of those characteristic British faces that, once seen, are never remembered, and her husband, a red-cheeked, white-whiskered creature who, like so many of his class, was under the impression that inordinate joviality can atone for an entire lack of ideas. He was rather sorry he had come, till Lady Narborough, looking at the great gilt clock that sprawled in gaudy curves on the mauve-draped mantel-shelf, exclaimed, 
How horrid of Henry Wotton to be so late. I sent round to him this morning on chance, and he promised faithfully not to disappoint me. It was some consolation that Harry was to be there, and when the door opened, and he heard his slow musical voice lending charm to some insincere apology, he ceased to feel bored. But at dinner he could not eat anything. Plate after plate went away untasted. Lady Narborough kept scolding him for what she called an insult to poor Adolf, who invented the menu specially for you. And now and then Lord Henry looked across at him, wondering at his silence and abstracted manner. From time to time the butler filled his glass with champagne. He drank eagerly, and his thirst seemed to increase. "'Dorian,' said Lord Henry at last, as the chauffeur was being handed around, "'what is the matter with you tonight? You are quite out of sorts.' "'I believe he is in love,' cried Lady Narbra, "'and that he is afraid to tell me for fear I should be jealous. "'He is quite right. I certainly should.' "'Dear Lady Narbra,' murmured Dorian, smiling, "'I have not been in love for a whole week. "'Not, in fact, since Madame de Ferrol left town.' "'How you men can fall in love with that woman!' exclaimed the old lady. "'I really cannot understand it.' "'It's simply because she remembers you when you were a little girl, Lady Narborough," said Lord Henry. "'She is the one link between us and your short frocks.' "'She does not remember my short frocks at all, Lord Henry. "'But I remember her very well at Vienna thirty years ago, "'and how décolleté she was then.' "'She still is décolleté,' he answered, taking an olive in his long fingers. "'And when she is in a very smart gown, she looks like an édition de luxe of a very bad French novel. "'She is really wonderful and full of surprises. "'Her capacity for family affection is extraordinary. "'When her third husband died, her hair turned quite gold from grief.' "'How can you, Harry?' cried Dorian. "'It is a most romantic explanation,' laughed the hostess. "'But her third husband, Lord Henry, you don't mean to say Ferrell is the fourth? "'Certainly, Lady Narborough. "'I don't believe a word of it. "'Well, ask Mr. Grey. "'He is one of her most intimate friends.' "'Is it true, Mr. Grey?' "'She assures me so, Lady Narborough,' said Dorian. "'I asked her whether, like Marguerite de Navarre,' She had their hearts embalmed and hung at her girdle. She told me she didn't, because none of them had any hearts at all. Four husbands! Upon my word, that is true de zelle. True de audace, I tell her, said Dorian. Oh, she is audacious enough for anything, my dear. And what is Ferrell like? I don't know him. The husbands of very beautiful women belong to the criminal classes, said Lord Henry, sipping his wine. Lady Narborough hit him with her fan. Lord Henry, I am not at all surprised that the world says that you are extremely wicked. But what world says that? asked Lord Henry, elevating his eyebrows. It can only be the next world. This world and I are on excellent terms. Everyone I know says that you are very wicked cried the old lady, shaking her head. Lord Henry looked serious for some moments. "'It is perfectly monstrous,' he said at last. "'The way people go about nowadays saying things against one behind one's back that are absolutely and entirely true.' "'Isn't he incorrigible?' cried Dorian, leaning forward in his chair. "'I hope so.' said his hostess, laughing. But really, if you all worship Madame de Ferrol in this ridiculous way, I shall have to marry again so as to be in the fashion. You will never marry again, Lady Narborough, broke in Lord Henry. You are far too happy. When a woman marries again, it is because she detested her first husband. When a man marries again, it is because he adored his first wife. Women try their luck, men risk theirs." "'Narborough wasn't perfect,' cried the old lady. "'If he had been, you would not have loved him, my dear lady,' was the rejoinder. "'Women love us for our defects. "'If we have enough of them, they will forgive us everything, even our intellects. "'You will never ask me to dinner again after saying this, I'm afraid, Lady Narborough, "'but it is quite true.' "'Of course it is true, Lord Henry. "'If we women did not love you for your defects, where would you all be?' 
Not one of you would ever be married. You would all be a set of unfortunate bachelors. Not, however, that that would alter you much. Nowadays, all the married men live like bachelors, and all the bachelors like married men. Fin de siècle, murmured Lord Henry. Fin du globe, answered his hostess. I wish it were fin du globe, said Dorian with a sigh. Life is a great disappointment. Ah, my dear, cried Lady Narborough, putting on her gloves, don't tell me that you have exhausted life. When a man says that, one knows that life has exhausted him. Lord Henry is very wicked, and I sometimes wish that I had been. But you are made to be good. You look so good. I must find you a nice wife. Lord Henry, don't you think that Mr. Grey should get married? I am always telling him so, Lady Narborough, said Lord Henry with a bow. Well, we must look out for a suitable match for him. I shall go through Debrett carefully tonight and draw out a list of all the eligible young ladies. With their ages, Lady Narborough? asked Dorian. Of course, with their ages, slightly edited, but nothing must be done in a hurry. I want it to be what the Morning Post calls a suitable alliance, and I want you both to be happy. "'What nonsense people talk about happy marriages!' exclaimed Lord Henry. "'A man can be happy with any woman, as long as he does not love her.' "'Ah, what a cynic you are!' cried the old lady, pushing back her chair and nodding to Lady Ruxton. "'You must come and dine with me soon again. "'You are really an admirable tonic, much better than what Sir Andrew prescribes for me. "'You must tell me what people you would like to meet, though. "'I want it to be a delightful gathering.' "'I like men who have a future and women who have a past,' he answered. "'Or do you think that would make it a petticoat party?' "'I fear so,' she said, laughing as she stood up. "'A thousand pardons, my dear Lady Ruxton,' she added. "'I didn't see you hadn't finished your cigarette.' Uh, "'Never mind, Lady Narborough. I smoke a great deal too much. I'm going to limit myself for the future.' "'Pray don't, Lady Ruxton,' said Lord Henry. "'Moderation is a fatal thing. "'Enough of it is as bad as a meal. "'More than enough is as good as a feast.' "'Lady Ruxton glanced at him curiously. "'You must come and explain that to me some afternoon, Lord Henry. "'It sounds a fascinating theory,' she murmured as she swept out of the room. "'Now, mind you don't stay too long over your politics and scandal,' "'cried Lady Narborough from the door. "'If you do, we are sure to squabble upstairs.' The men laughed, and Mr Chapman got up solemnly from the foot of the table and came up to the top. Dorian Gray changed his seat and went and sat by Lord Henry. Mr Chapman began to talk in a loud voice about the situation in the House of Commons. He guffawed at his adversaries. The word doctrinaire, word full of terror to the British mind, reappeared from time to time between his explosions. An alliterative prefix served as an ornament of oratory. He hoisted the Union Jack on the pinnacles of thought— the inherited stupidity of the race. Sound English common sense, he jovially termed it, was shown to be the proper bulwark for society. A smile curved Lord Henry's lips, and he turned round and looked at Dorian. "'Are you better, my dear fellow?' he asked. "'You seemed rather out of sorts at dinner.' "'I am well, Harry. I am tired, that is all. "'You were charming last night. The little Duchess is quite devoted to you. She tells me she is going down to Selby.' She has promised to come on the 20th. Is Monmouth going to be there too? Oh, yes, Harry. He bores me dreadfully, almost as much as he bores her. She is very clever, too clever for a woman. She lacks the indefinable charm of weakness. It is the feet of clay that make the gold of the image precious. Her feet are very pretty, but they are not feet of clay. White porcelain feet, if you like. They have been through the fire, and what fire does not destroy, it hardens. She has had experiences. How long has she been married? asked Dorian. An eternity, she tells me. I believe, according to the peerage, it is ten years, but ten years with Monmouth must have been like eternity with time thrown in. Who else is coming? Oh, the Willoughbys, Lord Rugby and his wife, our hostess, Geoffrey Clouston, the usual set— "'I have asked Lord Grotrian. "'I like him,' said Lord Henry. "'A great many people don't, but I find him charming. "'He atones for being occasionally somewhat overdressed "'by being always absolutely over-educated. "'He is a very modern type. "'I don't know if he'll be able to come, Harry. "'He may have to go to Monte Carlo with his father.' 
Ah, what a nuisance people's people are. Try and make him come. By the way, Dorian, you ran off very early last night. You left before eleven. What did you do afterwards? Did you go straight home? Dorian glanced at him hurriedly and frowned. No, Harry, he said at last. I did not get home till nearly three. Did you go to the club? Yes, he answered. Then he bit his lip. No, I I don't mean that. I didn't go to the club. I walked about. I forget what I did. How inquisitive you are, Harry. You always want to know what one has been doing. I always want to forget what I have been doing. I came in at half past two. If you wish to know the exact time, I had left my latchkey at home and my servant had to let me in. If you want any corroborative evidence on the subject, you can ask him. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. My dear fellow, as if I cared. Let us go up to the drawing room. No, Sherry, thank you, Mr Chapman. Something has happened to you, Dorian. Tell me what it is. You are not yourself tonight. Don't mind me, Harry. I am irritable and out of temper. I shall come round and see you tomorrow or next day. Make my excuses to Lady Narbra. I shan't go upstairs. I shall go home. I must go home. All right, Dorian. I dare say I shall see you tomorrow at tea time. The Duchess is coming. I will try to be there, Harry, he said, leaving the room. As he drove back to his own house, he was conscious that the sense of terror he thought he had strangled had come back to him. Lord Henry's casual questioning had made him lose his nerve for the moment, and he wanted his nerve still. Things that were dangerous had to be destroyed. He winced. He hated the idea of even touching them. Yet it had to be done. He realised that, and when he had locked the door of his library, he opened the secret press into which he had thrust Basil Hallward's coat and bag. A huge fire was blazing. He piled another log onto it. The smell of the singeing clothes and burning leather was horrible. It took him three quarters of an hour to consume everything. At the end, he felt faint and sick, and having lit some Algerian pastels on a pierced copper brazier, he bathed his hands and forehead with a cool, musk-scented vinegar. Suddenly he started. His eyes grew strangely bright, and he gnawed nervously at his underlip. Between two of the windows stood a large Florentine cabinet, made out of ebony, and inlaid with ivory and blue lapis. He watched it as though it were a thing that could fascinate and make afraid, as though it held something that he longed for and yet almost loathed. His breath quickened. A mad craving came over him. He lit a cigarette, then threw it away. His eyelids drooped till the long, fringed lashes almost touched his cheek. But he still watched the cabinet. At last, he got up from the sofa on which he had been lying, went over to it, and having unlocked it, touched some hidden spring. A triangular drawer passed slowly out. His fingers moved instinctively towards it, dipped in and closed on something. It was a small Chinese box of black and gold dust lacquer, elaborately wrought, the sides patterned with curved waves, and the silken cords hung with round crystals, and tasseled in plaited metal threads. He opened it. Inside was a green paste, waxy in lustre, the odour curiously heavy and persistent. He hesitated for some moments with a strangely immobile smile on his face. Then, shivering, though the atmosphere of the room was terribly hot, he drew himself up and glanced at the clock. It was twenty minutes to twelve. He put the box back, shutting the cabinet doors as he did so, and went into his bedroom. As midnight was striking bronze blows upon the dusky air, Dorian Gray, dressed commonly and with a muffler wrapped around his throat, crept quietly out of his house. In Bond Street he found a hansom with a good horse. He hailed it and in a low voice gave the driver an address. The man shook his head. It is too far for me, he muttered. Here is a sovereign for you, said Dorian. You shall have another if you drive fast. All right, sir, answered the man. You will be there in an hour and after his fare had got in, he turned his horse round and drove rapidly towards the river. Chapter 16 A cold rain began to fall, and the blurred street lamps looked ghastly in the dripping mist. The public houses were just closing, and dim men and women were clustering in broken groups round their doors. From some of the bars came the sound of horrible laughter, in others drunkards brawled and screamed. 
Lying back in the handsome with his hat pulled over his forehead, Dorian Gray watched with listless eyes the sordid shame of this great city, and now and then he repeated to himself the words that Lord Henry had said to him on the first day they had met, to cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by means of the soul. Yes, that was the secret. He had often tried it and would try it again now. There were opium dens where one could buy oblivion, dens of horror where the memory of old sins could be destroyed by the madness of sins that were new. The moon hung low in the sky like a yellow skull. From time to time a huge misshapen cloud stretched a long arm across and hid it. The gas lamps grew fewer and the streets more narrow and gloomy. Once the man had lost his way and had to drive back half a mile, a steam rose from the horse as it splashed up the puddles. The side windows of the hansom were clogged with a grey flannel mist. To cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by means of the soul. How the words rang in his ears. His soul certainly was sick to death. Was it true that the senses could cure it? Innocent blood had been spilled. What could atone for that? Uh, for that there was no atonement. But though forgiveness was impossible, forgetfulness was possible still, and he was determined to forget, to stamp the thing out, to crush it as one would crush the adder that had stung one. Indeed, what right had Basil to have spoken to him as he had done? Who had made him a judge over others? He had said things that were dreadful, horrible, not to be endured. On and on plodded the handsome, going slower, it seemed to him, at each step. He thrust up the trap and called to the man to drive faster. The hideous hunger for opium began to gnaw at him. His throat burned and his delicate hands twitched nervously together. He struck at the horse madly with his stick. The driver laughed and whipped up. He laughed in answer and the man was silent. The way seemed interminable, and the streets like the black web of some sprawling spider. The monotony became unbearable, and as the mist thickened, he felt afraid. Then they passed by lonely brickfields. The fog was lighter here, and he could see the strange bottle-shaped kilns with their orange fan-like tongues of fire. A dog barked as they went by, and far away in the darkness some wandering seagulls screamed. The horse stumbled in a rut, then swerved aside and broke into a gallop. After some time, they left the clay road and rattled again over rough paven streets. Most of the windows were dark, but now and then fantastic shadows were silhouetted against some lamp-lit blind. He watched them curiously. They moved like monstrous marionettes and made gestures like live things. He hated them. A dull rage was in his heart. As they turned a corner, a woman yelled something at them from an open door, and two men ran after the hansom for about a hundred yards. The driver beat at them with his whip. It is said that passion makes one think in a circle. Certainly, with hideous iteration, the bitten lips of Dorian Gray shaped and reshaped those subtle words that dealt with soul and sense, till he found in them the full expression, as it were, of his mood, and justified by intellectual approval passions that, without such justification, would still have dominated his temper. From cell to cell of his brain crept the one thought, and the wild desire to live, most terrible of all man's appetites, quickened into force each trembling nerve and fibre. Ugliness that had once been hateful to him because it made things real became dear to him now for that very reason. Ugliness was the one reality. The coarse brawl, the loathsome den, the crude violence of disordered life, the very vileness of thief and outcast were more vivid in their intense actuality of impression than all the gracious shapes of art, the dreamy shadows of song. They were what he needed for forgetfulness. In three days he would be free. Suddenly the man drew up with a jerk at the top of a dark lane. Over the low roofs and jagged chimney stacks of the houses rode the black masts of ships. Wreaths of white mist clung like ghostly sails to the yards. "'Somewhere about here, sir, ain't it?' he asked huskily through the trap. Dorian started and peered round. "'This will do,' he answered." and having got out hastily and given the driver the extra fare he had promised him, 
he walked quickly in the direction of the quay. Here and there a lantern gleamed at the stern of some huge merchantman. The light shook and splintered in the puddles. A red glare came out from an outward-bound steamer that was coaling. The slimy pavement looked like a wet Macintosh. He hurried on towards the left, glancing back now and then to see if he was being followed. In about seven or eight minutes he reached a small, shabby house that was wedged in between two gaunt factories. In one of the top windows stood a lamp. He stopped and gave a peculiar knock. After a little time he heard steps in the passage and the chain being unhooked. The door opened quietly and and he went in without saying a word to the squat, misshapen figure that flattened itself into the shadow as he passed. At the end of the hall hung a tattered green curtain that swayed and shook in the gusty wind which had followed him in from the street. He dragged it aside and entered a long, low room, which looked as if it had once been a third-rate dancing saloon. Shrill, flaring gas jets, dulled and distorted in the fly-blown mirrors that faced them, were ranged round the walls. Greasy reflectors of ribbed tin backed them, making quivering discs of light. The floor was covered with ochre-coloured sawdust, trampled here and there into mud, and stained with dark rings of spilled liquor. Some Malays were crouching by a little charcoal stove, playing with their bone counters and showing their white teeth as they chattered. In one corner, with his head buried in his arms, a sailor sprawled over a table, and by the tawdrily painted bar that rang across one complete side stood two haggard women, mocking an old man who was brushing the sleeves of his coat with an expression of disgust. "'He thinks he's got red ants on him!' laughed one of them as Dorian passed by. The man looked at her in terror and began to whimper. At the end of the room there was a little staircase leading to a darkened chamber. As Dorian hurried up its three rickety steps, the heavy odour of opium met him. He heaved a deep breath and his nostrils quivered with pleasure. When he entered, a young man with smooth yellow hair who was bending over a lamp lighting a long thin pipe looked up at him and nodded in a hesitating manner. "'You here, Adrian?' muttered Dorian. "'Where else should I be?' he answered listlessly. "'None of the chaps will speak to me now.' I thought you had left England. Darlington is not going to do anything. My brother paid the bill at last. George doesn't speak to me either. I don't care, he added with a sigh. As long as one has this stuff, one doesn't want friends. I think I've had too many friends. Dorian winced and looked round at the grotesque things that lay in such fantastic postures on the ragged mattresses. The twisted limbs, the gaping mouths, the staring, lustreless eyes fascinated him. He knew in what strange heavens they were suffering, and what dull hells were teaching them the secret of some new joy. They were better off than he was. He was prisoned in thought. Memory, like a horrible malady, was eating his soul away. From time to time he seemed to see the eyes of Basil Hallward looking at him, yet he felt he could not stay. The presence of Adrian Singleton troubled him. He wanted to be where no one would know who he was. He wanted to escape from himself. "'I'm going to the other place,' he said after a pause. "'On the wharf? Yes. "'That mad cat is sure to be there. "'They won't have her in this place now.' Dorian shrugged his shoulders. "'I am sick of women who love me. "'Women who hate me are much more interesting. "'Besides... The stuff is better. Much the same. I like it better. Come and have something to drink. I must have something. I don't want anything, murmured the young man. Never mind. Adrian Singleton rose up wearily and followed Dorian to the bar. A half-caste in a ragged turban and shabby ulster grinned a hideous greeting as he thrust a bottle of brandy and two tumblers in front of them. The women sidled up and began to chatter. Dorian turned his back on them and said something in a low voice to Adrian Singleton. A crooked smile, like the Malay crease, writhed across the face of one of the women. "'We are very proud tonight,' she sneered. "'For God's sake, don't talk to me,' cried Dorian, stamping his foot on the ground. "'What do you want? Money? Here it is. Don't ever talk to me again.' Two red sparks flashed for a moment in the woman's sodden eyes, then flickered out and left them dull and glazed. She tossed her head 
and raked the coins off the counter with greedy fingers. Her companion watched her enviously. "'It's no use,' sighed Adrian Singleton. "'I don't care to go back. What does it matter? I am quite happy here.' "'You will write to me if you want anything, won't you?' said Dorian, after a pause. "'Perhaps. "'Good night, then.' "'Good night,' answered the young man, passing up the steps and wiping his parched mouth with a handkerchief. Dorian walked to the door with a look of pain in his face. As he drew the curtain aside, a hideous laugh broke from the painted lips of the woman who had taken his money. "'There goes the devil's bargain,' she hiccoughed in a hoarse voice. "'Curse you,' he answered. "'Don't call me that.' She snapped her fingers. "'Prince Charming is what you like to be called, ain't it?' she yelled after him. The drowsy sailor leapt to his feet as she spoke and looked wildly around. The sound of the shutting of the hall door fell on his ear. He rushed out as if in pursuit. Dorian Gray hurried along the quay through the drizzling rain. His meeting with Adrian Singleton had strangely moved him, and he wondered if the ruin of that young life was really to be laid at his door, as Basil Hallward had said to him with such infamy of insult. He bit his lip, and for a few seconds his eyes grew sad. Yet, after all, what did it matter to him? One's days were too brief to take the burden of another's errors on one's shoulders. Each man lived his own life and paid his own price for living it. The only pity was one had to pay so often for a single fault. One had to pay over and over again, indeed. In her dealings with man, destiny never closed her accounts. There are moments, psychologists tell us, when the passion for sin, or for what the world calls sin, so dominates a nature that every fibre of the body, as every cell of the brain, seems to be instinct with fearful impulses. Men and women at such moments lose the freedom of their will. They move to their terrible end as automatons move. Choice is taken from them, and conscience is either killed or if it lives at all, lives but to give rebellion its fascination and disobedience its charm. For all sins, as theologians weary not of reminding us, are sins of disobedience. When that high spirit, that morning star of evil, fell from heaven, it was as a rebel that he fell. Callous, concentrated on evil, with stained mind and soul hungry for rebellion, Dorian Gray hastened on, quickening his step as he went, but as he darted aside into a dim archway that had served him often as a shortcut to the ill-famed place where he was going, he felt himself suddenly seized from behind, and before he had time to defend himself, he was thrust back against the wall with a brutal hand around his throat. He struggled madly for life, and by a terrible effort wrenched the tightening fingers away. In a second he heard the click of a revolver and saw the gleam of a polished barrel pointed straight at his head and the dusky form of a short, thick-set man facing him. "'What do you want?' he gasped. "'Keep quiet,' said the man. "'If you stir, I'll shoot you.' "'You are mad. What have I done to you?' "'You wrecked the life of Sybil Vane,' was the answer. "'And Sybil Vane was my sister. She killed herself. I know it. Her death is at your door. I swore I would kill you in return. For years I have sought you. I had no clue, no trace. The two people who could have described you were dead. I knew nothing of you but the pet name she used to call you. I heard it tonight by chance. Make your peace with God, for tonight you are going to die." Dorian Gray grew sick with fear. "'I never knew her,' he stammered. "'I never heard of her. You are mad.' "'You had better confess your sin, for as sure as I am James Vane, you are going to die.' There was a horrible moment. Dorian did not know what to say or do. "'Down on your knees,' growled the man. "'I give you one minute to make your peace. No more. I go on board tonight for India, and I must do my job first. One minute. That's all.' Dorian's arms fell to his side. Paralysed with terror, he did not know what to do. Suddenly, a wild hope flashed across his brain. Stop, he cried. How long is it since your sister died? Quick, tell me. Eighteen years, said the man. What do years matter? Eighteen years, 
laughed Dorian Gray with a touch of triumph in his voice. Eighteen years! Set me under the lamp and look at my face. James Vane hesitated for a moment, not understanding what was meant. Then he seized Dorian Gray and dragged him from the archway. Dim and wavering as was the wind-blown light, yet it served to show him the hideous error, as it seemed, into which he had fallen. For the face of the man he had sought to kill had all the bloom of boyhood, all the unstained purity of youth. He seemed little more than a lad of twenty summers, hardly older, if older indeed at all, than his sister had been when they had parted so many years ago. It was obvious that this was not the man who had destroyed her life. He loosened his hold and reeled back. "'My God! My God!' he cried. "'I I would have murdered you!' Dorian Gray drew a long breath. "'You have been on the brink of committing a terrible crime, my man,' he said, looking at him sternly. Let this be a warning to you not to take vengeance into your own hands. Forgive me, sir, muttered James Vane. I was deceived. A chance word I heard in that damned den sent me on the wrong track. You had better go home and put that pistol away or you may get into trouble, said Dorian, turning on his heel and going slowly down the street. James Vane stood on the pavement in horror. He was trembling from head to foot. After a little while, a black shadow that had been creeping along the dripping wall moved out into the light, and came close to him with stealthy footsteps. He felt a hand laid on his arm and looked round with a start. It was one of the women who had been drinking at the bar. "'Why didn't you kill him?' she hissed out, putting haggard face quite close to his. "'I knew you were following him when you rushed out from Daly's. You fool! You should have killed him! He has lots of money! And he's as bad as bad!' "'He's not the man I'm looking for,' he answered. "'And I want no man's money. I want a man's life. "'The man whose life I want must be nearly forty now. "'This one's little more than a boy. "'Thank God I have not got his blood on my hands.' "'The woman gave a bitter laugh. "'Little more than a boy,' she sneered. "'Why, man, it's nigh on eighteen years since Prince Charming made me what I am.' "'You lie!' cried James Vane. She raised her hand up to heaven. Before God I am telling the truth, she cried. Before God? Strike me dumb if it ain't so. He is the worst one that comes here. They say he has sold himself to the devil for a pretty face. It's nigh on eighteen years since I met him. He hasn't changed much since then. I have, though, she added with a sickly leer. You swear this? I swear it, came in a hoarse echo from her flat mouth. But don't give me away to him, she whined. I am afraid of him. Let me have some money for my night's lodging. He broke from her with an oath and rushed to the corner of the street, but Dorian Gray had disappeared. When he looked back, the woman had vanished also. Chapter 17 a week later, Dorian Gray was sitting in the conservatory at Selby Royal, talking to the pretty Duchess of Monmouth, who, with her husband, a jaded-looking man of sixty, was among his guests. It was tea-time, and the mellow light of the huge lace-covered lamp that stood on the table lit up the delicate china and hammered silver of the service at which the Duchess was presiding. Her white hands were moving daintily among the cups, and her full red lips were smiling at something that Dorian had whispered to her. Lord Henry was lying back in a silk-draped wicker chair, looking at them. On a peach-coloured divan sat Lady Narborough, pretending to listen to the Duke's description of the last Brazilian beetle that he had added to his collection. Three young men in elaborate smoking suits were handing tea cakes to some of the women. The house party consisted of twelve people, and there were more expected to arrive on the next day. "'What are you two talking about?' said Lord Henry, strolling over to the table and putting his cup down. "'I hope Dorian has told you about my plan for rechristening everything, Gladys. It is a delightful idea.' "'But I don't want to be rechristened, Harry,' rejoined the Duchess, looking up at him with her wonderful eyes. "'I am quite satisfied with my own name, and I am sure Mr Grey should be satisfied with his.' "'My dear Gladys, I would not alter either name for the world. They are perfect. I was thinking chiefly of flowers. Yesterday I cut an orchid from my buttonhole. It was a marvellous spotted thing, as, as effective as the seven deadly sins. 
In a thoughtless moment, I asked one of the gardeners what it was called. He told me it was a fine specimen of Robin Somniana, or something dreadful of that kind. It is a sad truth, but we have lost the faculty for giving lovely names to things. Names are everything. I never quarrel with actions. My one quarrel is with words. That is the reason I hate vulgar realism in literature. The man who would call a spade a spade should be compelled to use one. It is the only thing he is fit for. Then what should we call you, Harry? she asked. His name is Prince Paradox, said Dorian. I recognise him in a flash, exclaimed the Duchess. I won't hear of it, laughed Lord Henry, sinking into a chair. From a label there is no escape. I refuse the title. Royalties may not abdicate, fell as a warning from Pretty Lips. You wish me to defend my throne, then? Yes, I give the truths of tomorrow. I prefer the mistakes of today, she answered. You disarm me, Gladys, he cried, catching the willfulness of her mood. Of your shield, Harry, not of your spear. I never tilt against beauty, he said, with a wave of his hand. This is your error, Harry. Believe me, you value beauty far too much. How can you say that? I admit that I think it is better to be beautiful than to be good, but on the other hand, no one is more ready than I am to acknowledge that it is better to be good than to be ugly. Ugliness is one of the seven deadly sins, then, cried the Duchess. What becomes of your simile about the orchid? Ugliness is one of the seven deadly virtues, Gladys. You, as a good Tory, must not underrate them. Beer, the Bible, and the seven deadly virtues have made our England what she is. You don't like your country, then, she asked. I live in it. Then you may censure it the better. Why would you have me take the verdict of Europe on it? He inquired. What do they say of us? That Tartuff has emigrated to England and opened a shop? Is that yours, Harry? I give it to you. I could not use it. It is too true. You need not to be afraid. Our countrymen never recognise a description. They are practical. They are more cunning than practical. When they make up their ledger, they balance stupidity by wealth and vice by hypocrisy. Still, we have done great things. Great things have been thrust upon us, Gladys. We have carried their burden, only as far as the stock exchange. She shook her head. I believe in the race, she cried. It represents the survival of the pushing. It has development. Decay fascinates me more. What of art? she asked. It is a malady. Love? An illusion. Religion? The fashionable substitute for belief. You are a sceptic. Never! Scepticism is the beginning of faith. What are you? To define is to limit. Give me a clue. Threads snap. You would lose your way in the labyrinth. You bewilder me. Let's talk of someone else. Our host is a delightful topic. Years ago he was christened Prince Charming. Ah, oh, don't remind me of that, cried Dorian Gray. Our host is rather horrid this evening, answered the Duchess, colouring. I believe he thinks that Monmouth married me on purely scientific principles, as the best specimen he could find of a modern butterfly. Well, I hope he won't stick pins into you, Duchess, laughed Dorian. Oh, my maid does that already, Mr. Gray, when she is annoyed with me. And what does she get annoyed about with you, Duchess? Oh, for the most trivial things, Mr. Gray, I assure you, because usually because I come in ten minutes to nine and tell her that I must be dressed by half-past eight. How unreasonable of her. You should give her warning. I daren't, Mr. Gray. Why, she invents hats for me. You remember the one I wore at Lady Hilston's garden party? You don't, but it is nice of you to pretend that you do. Well, she made it out of nothing. All good hats are made out of nothing. Like all good reputations, Gladys, interrupted Lord Henry. Every effect that one produces gives one an enemy. To be popular, one must be a mediocrity. Not with women said the Duchess, shaking her head, and women rule the world. I assure you, we can't bear mediocrities. We women, as someone says, love with our ears, just as you men love with your eyes, if you ever love at all. 
it seems to me that we never do anything else, murmured Dorian. Ah, then you never really love, Mr. Grey, answered the Duchess with mock sadness. My dear Gladys, cried Lord Henry, how can you say that? Romance lives by repetition, and repetition converts an appetite into an art. Besides, each time that one loves is the only time one has ever loved. Difference of object does not alter singleness of passion, it merely intensifies it. We can have in life but one great experience at best, and the secret of life is to reproduce that experience as often as possible. "'Even when one has been wounded by it, Harry?' asked the Duchess after a pause. "'Especially when one has been wounded by it,' answered Lord Henry. The Duchess turned and looked at Dorian Gray with a curious expression in her eyes. "'What do you say to that, Mr Gray?' she inquired. Dorian hesitated for a moment, then he threw his head back and laughed. "'I always agree with Harry, Duchess. "'Even when he is wrong? "'Harry is never wrong, Duchess.' And does his philosophy make you happy? I have never searched for happiness. Who wants happiness? I have searched for pleasure. And found it, Mr Grey? Often. Too often. The Duchess sighed. I am searching for peace, she said. And if I don't go and dress, I shall have none this evening. Uh, let me get you some orchids, Duchess, cried Dorian, starting to his feet and walking down the conservatory. "'You are flirting disgracefully with him,' said Lord Henry to his cousin. "'You had better take care. He is very fascinating. "'If he were not, there would be no battle. "'Greek meets Greek, then. "'I am on the side of the Trojans. "'They fought for a woman. "'They were defeated. "'There are worse things than capture,' she answered. "'You gallop with a loose rein. "'Pace gives life,' was the riposte. I shall write it in my diary tonight. What? That a burnt child loves the fire. I am not even singed. My wings are untouched. You use them for everything except flight. Courage has passed from men to women. It is a new experience for us. You have a rival. Who? Oh, he laughed. Lady Narbra, he whispered. She perfectly adores him. You fill me with apprehension. The appeal to antiquity is fatal to us who are romanticists. Romanticists! You have all the methods of science. Men have educated us, but not explained you. Describe us as a sex, was her challenge. Sphinxes without secrets. She looked at him, smiling. How long Mr Grey is, she said. Let us go and help him. I have not yet told him the colour of my frock. Ah, you must suit your frock to his flowers, Gladys. That would be a premature surrender. Romantic art begins with its climax. I must keep an opportunity for retreat. In the Parthian manner? They found safety in the desert. I could not do that. Women are not always allowed a choice, he answered. But hardly had he finished the sentence before from the far end of the conservatory came a stifled groan, followed by the dull sound of a heavy fall. Everybody started up. The Duchess stood motionless in horror, and with fear in his eyes, Lord Henry rushed through the flapping palms to find Dorian Gray lying face downwards on the tiled floor in a death-like swoon. He was carried at once into the blue drawing room and laid upon one of the sofas. After a short time, he came to himself and looked round with a dazed expression. "'What has happened?' he answered. "'Oh, I remember. Am I safe here, Harry?' he began to tremble. "'My dear Dorian,' answered Lord Henry, "'you merely fainted, that was all. You must have overtired yourself. You had better not come down for dinner. I will take your place.' "'No, I will come down,' he said, struggling to his feet. "'I would rather come down. I must not be alone.' He went to his room and dressed. There was a wild recklessness of gaiety in his manner as he sat at table, but now and then a thrill of terror ran through him when he remembered that, pressed against the window of the conservatory like a white handkerchief, he had seen the face of James Vane watching him. And welcome back. 
I hope you enjoyed the penultimate part of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. If you did, then please consider supporting The Well Told Tale on Patreon at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next week with the tragic finale of this classic story. I hope you can join me.